Welcome to Blind Spots, a podcast where we're helping you fill the gap between what you want to do with your money and what you actually do. We are professional investors, writers, and financial planners helping you navigate the complexities of finance to optimize what you can control and cut out the rest. Join your host, Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese, as we discuss the questions and nuances surrounding everyday money management. Investment advisory services offered through Pure Portfolios, a registered investment advisor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese work for Pure Portfolios. Any opinions expressed by Nick and Aaron or any podcast guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pure Portfolios. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. It should not be construed as legal or tax advice and is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified attorney or tax professional. Clients of Pure Portfolios may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. This information is not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell securities. The information contained may have been compiled from third-party sources and is believed to be reliable. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blind Spots podcast. Today, we are going to be discussing the things that you actually have to do before you retire. And this is part one of a two-part series. And the we actually got a request for this topic of the podcast that came from a client's friend who also listens to the podcast. And they wanted to know the tangible steps that you actually need to do before you retire. Yeah. So we're going to get down into the details. There's many how to retirement guides, but most I feel like are just overarching themes. This is the actual logistical order of operation and things that you should be doing as you ramp up to make the transition seamless. I think that most pre-retiree style guides focus on understanding your current situation. Are you actually able to retire? Do the numbers work out? Is it feasible? Things like that. So, Well, and don't get me wrong, like those things are important, mm-hmm, but we're, we're going to rewind things even back further, starting at time zero today. You know, someone's going to retire in one year, all the things you should be thinking about or doing between now and that one year. So when you, again, when you retire, you don't have any loose ends or you're not stressed out or anything like that. Yeah. Retirement is one of those things that I think we think about, we talk about for almost our entire lives and we're working towards this mysterious retirement goal, but it's just not talked about the actual things that you need to do in order to get there. And then what happens once you're actually there and living it. So I'm excited for today's episode. So we're going to do a bit of role reversal. Aaron, uh, tease up some great questions for me. Usually I'm going to be teeing up some questions for her and then dovetailing my thoughts into this. I'm not a financial planner. I'm an investment guy. Aaron lives in this space. She's, uh, working towards her CFP, which is great. So it's just a, um, more of a lens on Aaron because this is her expertise and what she's aspiring to be a, a, she's already a great financial planner. Uh, she's looking to level up and help you along the way. So Aaron, what's the first thing a pre-retiree needs to do? You know, I think, yeah, step one sounds silly. It's kind of an obvious step, but it's necessary. And that is setting a date. And I think for a lot of people, since we're always in this working mindset, you just kind of continue to work. The days go by. I'm going to retire at such and such point. But that time comes up really quickly. And there's a lot of things that you need to do in order to be fully prepared for when that date comes about. So setting that date is kind of step one. Well, and it's easy. So that sounds super easy. I can't tell you how many people actually choose a tentative date, but they're not pot committed to it. And they, and Mm -hmm. they move it back or they come up with a reason. They're always coming up with reasons why that date won't work. Like, oh, if I stay in the quarter, then I vest in my 401k or I get this bonus or, you know, I'm due for a pay increase and companies with, with valuable employees, especially will make it very easy for you to stay, right? They'll, they'll increase your pay. They'll throw money at you. And, and they'll create this nice package because you're a, val- a valuable member of the team, but don't, and you know, I don't want to say you should be turning down money, but when you choose a date, 
make sure it's a tangible hard date because that does affect your plan if, if it changes every other month. Yeah. So anyways, you have to set the date and that also means, you know, telling your boss, notifying your employer, there's things that go into that. Or if you're a business owner, there can be a lot more that goes into that too. Shutting down your business, selling your business, mm -hmm. which could be a whole nother podcast episode. That would actually be a pretty interesting one. Yeah. And, and things we've heard from people, for those folks that work for a large company, they have to train someone for the role. They have to interview someone for a role. So there's all these other things that their employer is asking them to do that they didn't really count on. And then in the mm -hmm. meantime, like, I mean, let's be honest, half of the folks that we talk to are mentally checked out or they're starting to be mentally checked out of their job too. So a lot of these changes come with the whirlwind, other unintended consequences, which is why we say allow yourself a, a longer run rate as, as you have to do all these other things that you didn't really think about. Yeah. So set the date and commit to it. Step one. Okay. So the next thing a retiree needs to do after they've set the date is to decide, are they going to go at this alone? Are they going to be a DYI planner and investor, or are they going to hire an advisor? So what are some of the things to think about as a retiree makes that decision? Yeah, you have a great post on things that a DIY investor needs to know, a do-it-yourself investor. Um, so we'll, we'll reference that below, but I think it all really comes down to one is capabilities. Do you feel comfortable managing your investments? Are you able to, I guess, answer the questions of the unknown? You know, things come up all the time. Do you feel comfortable not having someone on speed dial that you can run those questions by? I think that's a really important factor. But the other piece of it is just your lifestyle. Do you want to manage money? It can become very overwhelming for people really quickly. And so some say, I just want to check out, you know, we'll have our plan. You'll send me my money and I'm just going to live my life and do the things that I want to do. So I think it just kind of, the, the biggest piece is if it comes down to how you want to live your daily life. Sure. And most people are so close to the money. Like you've grinded for 30, 40 years and you've built this mm -hmm. nest egg and, and you feel really good about it. But only you know the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that journey. Yeah. And I think that's that's a great thing, but it also can make you emotional. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're too close to the money, you're emotional, you end up making some suboptimal decisions. That's the biggest reason why people hire an advisor. They come to know that maybe they've made some bad decisions in the past. Like you said, they've spent their whole career building this wealth and they want to check out and do the things that they want to enjoy rather than grinding over their investment portfolio. Speaking for me personally, when it's my turn to retire and people are surprised to hear me say this, I am going to hire an advisor because I don't want to look at blinking green and red on a screen and rebalance my portfolio and worry about investment opportunities and all this stuff. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'll be completely done with it. So I am going to outsource my planning and portfolio management to a independent fiduciary advisor, hopefully at Pure Portfolios. Yeah, I think it kind of goes along the lines of doctors have other doctors, therapists, see therapists, even people who are money managers have other people manage their money. So okay. you just have to decide what's best for you well, and, and your I lifestyle. Think, I think the lesson that's important is we all have our own blind spots and biases, which is why we've built our investment approach the way we have. Like it's designed mm -hmm. to strip out human emotion and bias and blind spots because I don't care who you are, the closer you get to the money, the more those biases and blind spots get turned up. Mm -hmm. That goes for me, that goes for you, that goes for everybody on our team and every advisor that I've ever met in my life. Yeah. So once you decide on the date, you decide whether you're going to go at it alone or hire an advisor. Because that People, will change your activities. Right. That'll change what, what you do next. Mm -hmm. But I think regardless of whether you work with an advisor or work on your own, the question everyone loves to ask is what, Aaron? People always want to know how much do I need in order to retire? 
And that is the wrong question. Why is that the wrong question? Putting out an arbitrary number of you need a million dollars. That's usually people's target. Like, oh, I don't have a million dollars. I, I don't think I can retire. It just doesn't make sense because someone might spend $20,000 a year. Another person might spend $200,000 a year. So people are going to have wildly different numbers. Everyone's financial situation is going to be totally different. And so you have to first decide what your lifestyle is going to be, what it's going to look like, what are your expenses going to be, what assets do you have, what income do you have that's tied to financial markets, what's not tied to financial markets. There's so many different pieces of the puzzle. You can't just ask a single question and get a black and white answer. And I think the first question, and I agree with all that, but I think the first question that determines a lot of what you said is where a person lives. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I always come back to this and, you know, if I take, if I move out to the backwoods in Kansas, nothing against Kansas, and I hunker down and live in a, in a tent, that's a completely different expense profile than if I lived to LA and have a house on, you know, Redondo beach or whatever, that that's mm -hmm. the opposite extreme, two very yeah. different numbers, two very different lifestyles, but it all stems from where I choose to live. Yeah, that is a big one. And especially when you start looking into things like estate planning that can help kind of determine what decisions you make, especially as far as where you live and where you plan on spending the rest of your life. The state that you live in, if you're in the United States, can change a lot about your financial plan too. Yeah, like state income taxes, property taxes, just general cost of living, access to mm -hmm. health care. Yeah. I mean, if you like to travel, how close are you to an airport? Like all of these things layer in to your ideal life and it's our job on this podcast to help you frame that before you go and live off someplace and if you really like to travel and you're five hours from an airport that doesn't that doesn't work out so well yeah exactly maybe you should just touch on just briefly how people can back into the right number for them okay so you would be i'm shocked and you would be shocked at how many people don't know what they're spending and I think that's the first place to start. So once you identify where you'd want to live, it's time to just dig into the weeds, dig into everything. Look, scour bank account info and find out what is going out the door. Okay, it sounds very easy. I would say over half the people that we talk to have no clue what they're spending. Okay, I this would is going to be 75%. That's probably fair. But also know there's another level to this. What you're spending now doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're going to be spending when you retire. Because think about mm -hmm. it. You're going to have different habits. You're going to have a new identity. You might be doing part-time consulting. You might be working in a passion hobby. Like your day-to-day -day routine is going to look completely different. So we always mm -hmm. tell people the first year that you retire, track everything. Okay. But this is a planning podcast. So before the year before that you retire, a good proxy for that is to just itemize every single expense that's going out the door now, and then you can work off of that number. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So once once you do that, you're going to do the same thing on the asset side. So investable assets, you might have an idea of what your social security income is or pension income. You might have, what other income sources am I forgetting? Just every, every asset or income source that you have available to you. And you're going to run that out for 10, 20 years. And you're going to set a zero return assumption, right? So over 10, 20 years, you have to assume a rate of return. Zero that out. Make it zero, which sounds stupid, but this is important. You want to be in a place where when you, when you factor in your expenses, your income, your investable assets, you've identified where you'd like to live, your tax situation, what you're going to spend on healthcare, all of that. Run it out 10, 20 years at a return rate of zero. If your plan is favorable, meaning it, you're still, you still have assets at the end of that plan, that's a very good place to be because you don't need to be bailed out by financial market returns to have a successful retirement. We call it margin of safety. Or a buffer. A buffer. So your plan's not going to go according to plan. We've seen that this year. We've seen it last year. We saw it in 2021, or excuse me, 2020. So you want to bulletproof your plan. So when things get weird, you're still going to be okay. That's how you do it. 
So how can people weave in, and I hate like identify your goals because all advisors talk like that and I think it's stupid. Yeah. So I'm basically saying the same thing. I just want to phrase it a different way. So how can mm -hmm. we account for the bucket list type of things, your ideal, your best life, just layering in everything that you'd want to do as you move on from the man or woman employer? Yeah. So I think this is where scenario analysis really comes in handy. It's after we've built your foundational financial plan, as we like to call it, it's just kind of the very basics. We'll add in all of the things that you want to do. It's your best case scenario. It's the vacations. It's just everything. It's your, your best case scenario. If that doesn't work, that's when we kind of start pairing things back. What are we willing to give up if things don't go exactly the way that we want it to? And we just kind of go from there. And we typically will end up having some sort of best case scenario, medium case scenario, and like worst case scenario. If all hell breaks loose, you know, we're still going to put food on the table and have a roof over our head. But again, it still builds in that margin of safety, but then you can kind of start playing with those different levers and seeing, okay, maybe if I don't take that vacation, I can still buy a new car every five years or whatever it may be for that person. Um, but scenarios is kind of where those bucket list items come in. But the first go, the first goals or bucket mm -hmm. list lifestyle, you should let it rip. You should have yourself a yeah. day. Be be aggressive. List everything that you'd want to do. Yeah. And one, it's fun to do that. But mm -hmm. two, it's easy to take stuff like, okay, I was being egregious there. That makes no sense. I'm going to take this back. But start yeah. by living your best life, opening it up and letting her rip. Yeah. Because it really opens up the conversation to one, maybe that's how you were living before. You didn't really, you know, check the finances before you made decisions. So this helps you make decisions within the context of your financial plan. So it can kind of uncover some of those habits, I guess. The, the other upside to doing that kind of activity is that you just see what's possible and what's not. You find the breaking points in your plan is what I was trying to say. Right. And, and most breaking points, most plans break not because of the Fed or inflation or Vladimir Putin. Yeah. They break because poor planning and people spend way too much. Like that's mm -hmm. the biggest, like if you're going to worry about anything, worry about how much you spend. And I'm not saying yeah. you should penny pinch or not buy your latte at Starbucks. I'm talking about getting the big things right and checking yourself when you are either not living in accordance with the plan. So, so we'll put, we'll, we'll put together these elaborate plans for people with set expenses, set expenses, a glide path for everything. And then they'll just go off on their own. They'll basically go rogue and mm -hmm. they might come back and say, Hey, my plan's not on track. It's because, well, you're not following the plan. You're, you're going yeah. rogue. Mm -hmm. So, so it's important once you build that framework to operate within the framework. Yeah. Yeah. We often like, talk about. Oh, I was going to ask you that, like, there was a famous, um, singer, pop star and I'm, and I'm don't, I'm not a, uh, a pop culture guy, but I forget, but she basically sued her financial advisor because she spent all of her money. And in court, the advisor's defense team was like, did we really need to tell this person that if they spent all the money, then they wouldn't have any money. And they ended up winning the case. So the, the advisor actually ended up winning the case because this person Despite her advisor's good intentions and and building a financial plan, at the end of the day, like we can't tell you you can't spend your money. It's it's your money. So if you go ahead and light it on fire, there there's nothing that can save you from that. Mm -hmm. And that's for if you're retiring in thirty years or three months. Hey, let's talk about health insurance. Hot health insurance talk. So if if you everyone's retire, favorite topic. Everyone's favorite topic. I'm not a Medicare expert, but I know. If you retire before age 65, you have some healthcare decisions to make. So Aaron, mm -hmm. can you talk about that journey and what people th should be thinking about on the healthcare side? Yeah. So if you're retiring before 65, as most people know, you do not yet qualify for Medicare. Um, so like you just said, Nick, you have some decisions to make. So sometimes if you're married, you can get on your spouse's um, 
insurance if they are still working, which can be very beneficial and help you save some money in the long run. Um, but if you do not have that option available to you, private insurance is kind of the way to go. Um, and it can be very expensive and it's one of those line items that people don't often account for. So as you're looking to retire, if you're retiring before 65, it's a good idea to just get online, try to get some quotes so you at least have an idea of what you might be paying in the near future. What is the acronym, I forget, for leaving a company and then you have like 18 months to stay on their oh. plan? COBRA. COBRA. So check mm -hmm. with your HR person when you retire and inquire about mm -hmm. COBRA because that could be a nice bridge. Like if you're 63 and a half, that might carry you to 65, which is, which saves you a headache because from what I've heard, pri private insurance can be, can be daunting and there's a lot of different choices. Each state is different. So mm -hmm. I've, I, so when I started pure portfolios, I, I had to go the private insurance route and I found an insurance broker which was recommended by a friend. And that was very helpful because I wasn't an expert and they were yeah. um, kind of validated by my friends. So I didn't feel like I was getting fleeced and I ended up finding a plan that worked for me and my family. So uh, I don't know if we can include a link to that, but uh, that might be worthwhile for folks that are looking for private insurance to go the broker route. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, COBRA is a great option. It's an easy easy way to enroll in health insurance that isn't provided directly by your employer, but they can be very expensive and sometimes more expensive than private insurance. So depending on what your needs are, I would just evaluate your options. Okay. Let's talk taxes. Oh, another note on Medicare though, before we get to taxes is the enrollment period is very important that you know and understand what your specific enrollment period for Medicare is because there can be some big consequences if you don't do things in the correct time frame. So what's a good resource for people to learn more about Medicare? Like when should they be enrolling? So this can be on the record, but AARP, I've heard it's a great resource. I don't know anything about it. I don't spend too much time on the website. I'm 40 years old, but I've heard good things about the AARP website and they have a Twitter, Looks like they're pretty active on there. So go ahead and check that out. Yeah. So for Medicare benefits, you can learn more actually at ssa.gov, which for those who don't know, it's the Social Security Administration. That's where you sign up for Social Security and Medicare. They are two separate choices, which are oftentimes done at the same time, but they are two separate decisions that you have to make elections on. So we'll leave and that I below as well. And I've actually heard the social security people are very helpful in answering mm -hmm. questions. Like I've heard that yeah. from almost every retiree. So that, well, and that makes sense. That's all they do all day, yeah. every day. The rules are always changing. So don't be afraid. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the government, but don't be afraid to lean on social security government employee for this, because I've heard they're great. SSA is not the DMV. Just put it that way. Yes, that's a good way of saying it. Let's talk taxes. So Let's do taxes it. before retirement and after retirement, completely different game. So what mm -hmm. are some of the things people should be thinking about in regards to taxes? Common misconception on taxes from pre-retiree to post-retiree is 99% of the time people think that their tax rate is going to go down simply because they're not working anymore. And I think that stems from the idea that they don't have earned income. But in America, we know that 401ks are one of the largest pools of savings for retirement. I forget the statistic I read the other day, but I think it's like 88% of retirement or something is in 401ks. So that means that when you retire and you are withdrawing of your, out of your 401k or a traditional IRA, that's pre-tax money. So any money that you are withdrawing and taking distributions on now it becomes taxable income. So if you made 50,000 a year before and you take 50,000 out of your IRA, it's going to be taxed at the same rate. So to make a long story short, taxes are not always less in retirement than they were before retirement. 
Well, and, and we've had podcasts, blog after blog about capital gains taxes, asset mm -hmm. location mistakes, owning mutual funds, uh, having investment income uh, in taxable accounts. So all of these things add up. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Aaron, like for, for newer clients that we onboard, they're, they're leaking tax oil, for lack of a better term, just by tightening some things up, where they own certain assets, how yeah. certain types of accounts are invested. You know, we're, we're able to save them thousands in tax alpha, as, as we call it, not by predicting what the market does next, just by cleaning up and taking the low-hanging fruit. So make sure that you understand what triggers a taxable event, both at the asset level and the account level. Yeah. And then another thing that we've been helping people with is when to exercise stock options, mm -hmm. right? In layering, the, layering those depending on cost basis, on your current tax rate versus future tax rates. So there's, those can be pretty complex and each company is a little bit different. So I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but know that, you know, depending on the rules of your company, there, there would be a strategy to minimize taxes uh, and maximize the benefit of those options. Yeah. Liquidation priority is off, oftentimes something that we will do with pre-retirees and those who are just retired, which just means in fancy terms that we're deciding where we're gonna take the money from. So sometimes people just have a traditional IRA, that's where your money's gonna come out of. Sometimes you have taxable accounts and a Roth account and a traditional IRA. So try to figure out what the best and tax, most tax efficient way to distribute that to you is. Mm -hmm. So the next step would be more like putting it all together. So you're about to retire, putting it all together, all the things that we've talked about, putting that into financial planning software, or if you're doing it yourself, maybe you have spreadsheets. So in part two, unless there's anything Aaron has to add, in part two, we'll, we'll talk about the actual execution when it's time to retire, things that you should be thinking about as you put your plan together, things that you should be monitoring as you go through time as a new retiree. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that I missed or you want to add to that? I don't think anything on this episode, but I'm excited to get into our next one where we talk about transition and what life looks like after our retirement date has passed. So this is everything leading up to retirement, taking the low-hanging fruit, focusing on the things that you can control. In the next episode, we'll get into when the rubber meets the road, when you walk into your boss's office and say, I'm done with you, crack whatever beverage of choice that you like, and then we'll talk about the next chapter. Yeah. Okay. Bad actor of the week. So big headline in the last week of February said pro athletes allegedly duped by a fired financial advisor go after Morgan Stanley. So this takes the story from Drew Holiday, who is an NBA player, Chandler Parsons and Courtney mm -hmm. Lee. You know I, I know. Yep. But those are the athletes who all worked with a, this advisor who was previously at Wells Fargo, then went to Merrill Lynch. And they essentially told Drew Holiday that 70% of the client list was made up of former athletes. So the big issue here is apparently this advisor invested 2.3 million of Drew Holiday and his wife's money into quote unquote dubious individuals and entities. And they say that most of the money has since disappeared. So the whole premise of this investigation was just looking into how it's possible that such a large and well-known firm like Morgan Stanley would enable someone like this advisor to be in the position and um, allow him to move money out of the, out of his accounts the way that he did. And the holidays were just surprised that that was even able to happen in the first place. So I feel bad for the holidays, but a lot of people get duped by the social proof, as I call it, of a, of a large institution. Like Morgan Stanley is a household name. Merrill Lynch is a household name. Wells Fargo is a household name. A lot of these institutions have been at the forefront of some of the biggest corporate frauds ever. Mm -hmm. And I, I track financial services, SEC fines, and I do it every year. And every year, it's the same handful of companies, the ones that I just mentioned, among others, that lead the list. And it's for different offenses. 
And no matter how big you are, no matter how many clients you have or how long you've been in business, there's no regulation for human greed. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you work for a public company and you're getting leaned on to sell and bring in assets and bring in revenue at all costs, like you can't serve your clients and act in their best interest and maximize profits for the shareholders. Those are two inconsistent overarching goals. Yet, I mean, you look at where the assets are in this country and the majority of them are at firms just like this. And it's just a, it's, it's a bad deal. Like it's just a fundamental misalignment of incentives. The people working for these companies are, are going to have a poor outcome. Now, no, you know, I shouldn't say that in absolutes could have a, could have a poor outcome because of the misalignment that I just described. I don't want to rant, but I mean, the long story short is humans respond to incentives. Advisors at big wall street firms, publicly traded firms are incentivized to gather assets and sell. I mean, hell, look at their compensation plans, which are public. They, they tell you exactly what the advisor must sell in order to get paid X. It's, mm -hmm. it's very open and transparent. And, and if I'm a client and I'm doing my homework and I'm reading that, I'm asking, how in the hell is that good for me? How is an advisor having to cross sell five extra bank products good for me? How is an advisor requ that's required to bring in 50 million in new assets? How is that good for me? Like that's how they get paid. That's what they're going to focus on. Where's, where's the, where's the compensation for good client outcomes? It's not there. They're only incentivized yeah. to keep you as a client. That's so they'll do the bare minimum to keep you as a client so they can get their 50% or 40% of your revenue. That's just a, that's a bad setup. And this stuff doesn't surprise me. This, this you, you can set your watch to this in 2022. You could set your watch to it in 1995 and you'll be able to set your watch to it in 2035. It's time for the consumers to take ownership and wise up and stop working with these type of companies. Yeah. And I think it's, kind of get desensitized by seeing just these random names in articles you know miss susie got duped by some advisor somewhere but these are high profile people people know who these athletes and actors and whatever are and the same thing is happening to them so no one is exempt from mm -hmm. the systematic problems well, and think about a high profile athlete. I mean, a lot of time the agents or people that they hire are doing this stuff with them. And these, and, and mm -hmm. these folks are professionals. Yeah. So if a professional consultant, professional agent can get duped, then Susie can get duped. You know, anybody can get duped. Yeah. And it just, it, it just so happens the places, the institutions in which they get duped are rinsed and repeated over and over year after yeah. year. You know, that's not to say that independent advisors can't go rogue, but in my experience, uh, just by looking at the SEC fines, the volume, the find amount, much, 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 much more prevalent in the big Wall Street publicly traded company realm. Yeah. I think that is good for today. We will see you in our next episode of Blind Spots.